Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we try to cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space. I'm Griff Somke. And I'm Jay McKenzie. COVID rates are exploding in China. Will it spread to the world again? DeMar Hamlin collapsed during Monday Night Football. Why is the right blaming the COVID-19 vaccine? And Ray Epps did January 6th is back in MAGA media. We'll tell you why. If you like what you're hearing, please make sure to subscribe to the newsletter at didnothingwrongpod.com. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, please give us a five-star rating. We've got a great show for you today. Thanks for joining us. We talked recently about why China was in a favorable position when it comes to Russia's war in Ukraine. The Chinese government is happy to let Russia weaken itself while the United States stays focused on aiding the Ukrainian war effort. However, all is not well on the domestic front in China. Xi's very unpopular zero-COVID lockdown policies were finally loosened, and as a result, COVID-19 has run rampant in the country. It's hard to get an accurate read on the number of cases and deaths in China, but a recent NPR report suggests that as many as 800 million Chinese citizens could be infected with COVID-19 this winter, leading to as many as half a million deaths. Not long ago, even some Western media outlets were praising China's COVID response. How did we end up here? Well, as you talked about, the zero COVID policy was incredibly unpopular. The unpopularity coupled with Omicron and Omicron spread and China's incapability of stopping it, even with these, frankly, just absurd and kind of horrifying zero COVID policies, eventually led them to drop it. And I think there was some degree of acceptance that it's going to get here no matter what. And people hate this zero COVID policy. So they kind of ripped the Band-Aid off. Right. And I mean, the reason that they really can't stop Omicron is that China's vaccine is bad. Right. It is much less effective than the Western options, but China being an authoritarian state and the communist regime being dependent on the propaganda it puts out, and a lot of that propaganda now is aimed at the West and aimed at China's ambitions as global superpower. And China's ambitions as a global superpower mean that they can't accept all this Western aid. Because why, if China can rival the United States and perhaps overtake or surpass the United States on the world stage, why would they need Western medicine? Why would they need anything that we have? Because their their propaganda, their state-run media can't explain that. No. And they're dependent on it. They have to have the narrative of, we're better, this is our time, it's the Chinese century now, we're finally going to take you know our rightful place on the world stage and get our due. And that's going to be real hard to do if you're still dependent on the West for things like vaccines. We're supposed to be better than they are. How are we still taking their vaccines? So they haven't gone ahead and rolled out any of the Western vaccines. Yeah, they're not even available in mainland China, right? No, no, you got to go to Hong Kong for that. And that's only recently, uh-huh. recently that they even opened it up and it's not even clear how many people can get there and right how much of a stockpile they have. And it's, you have to be able to prove that you haven't recently had COVID. Mm-hmm. It's a whole thing and that they just now started right. in Hong Kong, which they can still kind of pretend is, is not the mainland or it's different. Yeah. Yeah, and they're pretending. And this didn't start until like, a couple months ago when German Chancellor Olaf Scholz made a deal to ship them 11,000 doses. And I think that there's a certain hesitation on the part of the pharmaceutical companies here, Pfizer, Moderna, because China wants this technology. China wants the mRNA technology, and the pharmaceutical companies don't necessarily want to give that to them. Because they know what happens when China gets a hold of your technology to some extent. They've offered to essentially license the vaccine to sell it. And this isn't what they want right now. So they're a bit at loggerheads about that. Yeah, they want to know how to produce it themselves and then claim it's their own. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be handed 
something with a Pfizer logo on it and then giving it to their own people because mm-hmm. then their people say, what's this and what happened to this homemade vaccine that that was supposedly as good? And you saw the same thing with Russia with their Sputnik vaccine, where some tests seem to show that it was just as effective or maybe even more effective mm-hmm. than Western counterparts. Mm-hmm. But then they shipped it out to other countries and it wasn't that it wasn't that effective. And it was sometimes it was a question of was this properly handled or was it intentionally not properly handled? So someone couldn't go test it and figure out how effective it was. But it's it's the same issue in China. Mm -hmm. And it and it it also is worth pointing out that they've been shipping this vaccine around the world Mm -hmm. to primarily places along the new Silk Road. But a lot of it is is in Africa, mm-hmm. in South America, where they have a lot of investments in infrastructure. And they're attempting to throw money at these countries to gain influence, to have Huawei and ZTE, their telecommunications firms, set up shop and start collecting data. And, and they want to have a monopoly on... 5G in these in these developing countries and and then have some political power that comes with that. It's it's part of a coordinated effort to like we said surpass the United States and if they're going around handing a a bad vaccine to people then that immediately undercuts that. Right, and that does seem to be the case. It's not necessarily bad, but it's nowhere near as effective. There's an article in The Economist. I'm going to quote it for this. The Chinese shot may also be less effective at limiting infections. For those aged under 60 in Hong Kong, the German-developed vaccine, which would be the Pfizer, significantly limited even mild cases of Omicron after just one jab. In contrast, for mild infections, Sinovac shot had no detectable effect after one or two doses and only offered about half the protection of the mRNA vaccine after three. That's a real hard thing to compete with if you're trying to say our vaccine is comparable to that, but you need three doses and even then you're only getting 40% of the protection. And that's not entirely inconsistent with what trials in Chile, trials in Brazil have found, that the stuff is not as effective. So it sort of puts a new light on zero COVID that they knew they didn't have an effective vaccine here. But they couldn't say it. Yeah, they can't say but that. They couldn't admit it. Because if they admit it, then, well, we're not on the prestigious level that we're claiming to be. So until we can either develop our own or steal it from one of the two companies that has this technology at this point. Mm hmm. We need to keep everybody locked down or else we're going to get a raving wave of COVID that might just absolutely wipe us out. And yeah, you mentioned stealing the formulas of the vaccine. There's a pretty well-documented history of China being very involved in IP theft and particularly against the United States. Mm -hmm. I think the, the estimates are well into the hundreds of millions of dollars of intellectual property that China is stealing from the U.S. Oh, every year in, in various ways. So it's not like that was outside the realm of possibility. It's not like that wasn't something that they could assign one of their hacking units to and say, do your best, take your shot. And I, I do think that's fair. I think they were waiting to see if they could steal it or develop their own or some other option would come forward. We know that China has thrown money at research institutions in the United States, and Mm -hmm. that has paid off for them in the past. It has. They've bought themselves quite a few professors over here. They give you a quote-unquote teaching job at a university in China and a stipend. All you got to do is bring your work over and let them copy it. And when the FBI says in you know Christopher Ray said they average a new counterintelligence case against China every 12 hours a lot of those counterintelligence cases are in the academic field they are in the intellectual property theft field they are academics who've been sent over as part of the 10,000 talents program that they have which basically means go to an american research institution and steal everything you can and bring it back over here we've got 
people who are pretending to be, oh, I'm just a doctor, I'm a researcher, but these people are PLA colonels. They are engaged in this active campaign of come over here and get the technology however you can get it. And it's endemic. Just all kinds of cases all over the place that you hear about this. And they are going to, at some point, run into the limits of, of what you can do with that. And that might be here. They can't get their hands on the formula. They want the mRNA vaccine. They can't figure out how to duplicate that. And they are essentially up a creek with the idea of this outbreak. They pushed zero COVID as far as it would go. She really had a lot riding on that. And now the protests finally got to the point where they they had to loosen the grip. They had to let go. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it was bad. And they were unprecedented. And that wasn't something that Western media paid a lot of attention to. I, I just, we are not as focused on international news and what's happening outside of the U.S. as I think we should be. And I think that's part of the reason we like to talk about this stuff here. But yeah, the protests were serious and they mm -hmm. were they were on a scale that hadn't been seen for since 1989. Yeah, Tiananmen Square. That was the last time. Yeah, it really was. And it was it was getting to the point where something had to be done. But they knew they knew and they have known that Omicron is roughly 70 times more transmissible than Delta was. Right. They knew the vaccine didn't work properly and Eventually, it just caught up with them. And you mentioned China's espionage operations. And I think something that I want to mention and that I, I think we have to address is the fact that Chinese spies have gotten caught in the U.S., in Canada. We know they're stealing our intellectual property. And we have evidence in many cases that some of these people are officers in Chinese intelligence. It, it is a provable fact at times. And whenever these people are caught stealing information, trying to take it back to mainland China, they always go to the same defense. They always say that it is a racist witch hunt against them. Mm -hmm. They claim they really like to lean into the fact that, oh, the U.S. is just targeting me because I'm Asian. And it immediately turned it into a racial profiling case. And they know that they're going to find sympathetic voices on the left that are going to buy into that. And it is a very cynical ploy. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth reminding people that while China loves to go to this defense, they are actually a very racist country. And they, well, you, you look at what is happening in the Western Chinese province of Xinjiang mm -hmm. and the persecution. Some have called it, I think, accurately a genocide of the Uyghur Muslim population there. They are essentially attempting to destroy their culture and their, their way of life, and they want to assimilate them into their own. But it is a forcible assimilation. This is not something that is just... It's not an isolated incident. No, no. It's also happening to a lesser degree, but it is occurring with the Tibetan population to the Mongolian population in China. China believes in the superiority of the, the Han race, and they like this defense of the West is racist. The West just goes after us because they don't like Asian people. Well, there is a multi-million dollar industry in making videos about how other places are not as good as China. They can't get enough of this. They do a lot of trade in Africa these days. They do a lot of business with Africa because of the Belt and Road. And they make quite a few videos starring the locals, getting them to say things, getting them to hold up signs, getting them to do dances and whatnot. And there are, are people making a whole ton of money on this back in China because a lot of the Chinese love watching videos about, hey, our, our lifestyle is better, our way of life is better. And they've found people who are poor enough that, Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll make a video. Yeah, that's fine. I need to eat this week. Some of these people are paid by the government. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely love doing it to black people. That is their biggest target of a lot of this is let's make fun of black people. They're huge on this. 
And that would probably explain a recent Reuters article that talks about the opinion most of the world has of China at this point. 929-2022. In the United States, 82% of respondents this year expressed an unfavorable opinion of China, up from 79% in 2020. The percentage of those in the world who said that they had, quote, no confidence in Xi to do the right thing regarding world affairs was 87% in South Korea in 2022, and that's up from 29% in 2015. And in England, the figure increased to 70% in 2022 from 44% in 2014. They've flushed an awful lot of goodwill and good perception, good optics on their part down the toilet in the last decade. That is one thing that you know Xi's legacy will probably be remembered for is essentially turning China into this almost pariah state in a lot of ways, getting them to the point where internationally nobody really likes them. There are people who take their money and like them that far. I think it is it is worth pointing out and it is worth saying that there is a real problem of anti-Asian violence mm-hmm. in the United States and Trump and plenty of right-wing rhetoric, especially related to COVID and claiming the, the vaccine was bioengineered in a lab. All of that made it worse. And we don't want to downplay that and claim that it isn't happening and it isn't a problem. It absolutely is. But it is a difficult and nuanced topic. And and we we know it's hard to find a center here and to be sensitive to to everyone's concerns and fears. And so we don't we don't want to downplay that. Right. But we also feel like we need to be honest about what is occurring here. And there is just a real crazy dichotomy between how China portrays itself as this victim of racist bias and violence and these attacks and these witch hunts on the international stage, whereas at home, they are the ones carrying out the persecutions. They're they're committing a genocide. Right. And I, I wanted to pull this up. It's a Time Magazine article, and they interviewed a woman... Apologies for the pronunciation here, but it is Gulzira Alkan, who is a survivor of the quote unquote re education centers in Xinjiang, China. And she talked about her experience there and the abuse that she suffered. That camp guards told detainees that, quote, from now on, all ethnicities will be as one and must share the same language and food. She also said, we all had to eat pork. She is a observant Muslim. And she said, we all had to eat pork. And I was forced to burn a Quran and a prayer mat. There was to be no more praying. So when you talk about an actual genocide, this is what you mean. And mm-hmm. they are demanding that you convert. Yeah. That you become like them because they believe they are superior. This is... Very reminiscent, although much farther down the road than what some of the more extreme elements of the right in the United States wanted to do to Islamic folks after 9-11. They never got anywhere near this, but there was that same sort of sentiment. And China has tried to play it off that this is terrorism, that these people are terrorists. They've used a lot of the same playbook to go ahead and justify putting these people into camps, putting these people into gulags, forcing them to do labor, trying to wipe out their religion, trying to make them essentially disappear as a people. And this is something that when claims of the United States as the most racist country in the world get brought up, I think need to get addressed. Well, and they do. They do get brought up a lot mm -hmm. by Chinese state-run media. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you it's all made up. They'll tell you it's all fake news, which they do every time it gets brought up. But there is a mountain of evidence out there. There are a mountain of survivors. There are hundreds upon hundreds of people who've gotten out of it and told their stories. They're not all lying. There are pictures. There are satellite photos. They are in the midst of a genocide. 
And this is one of the reasons why I think a lot of the world just doesn't like them or trust them very much at this point. And it's why, going back to where we started here, it is why China and the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party cannot admit that their vaccine was far inferior. And if we if we look at China's record on COVID-19, we talked about this, but the, the numbers of cases and deaths from the very beginning did not did not sound plausible. No. With a population well over a billion in China, they were talking about daily cases in, in the early days in the tens and perhaps hundreds and the deaths just absurdly low. Right. I, I, impossibly low when you saw the pictures of hospitals, of people being boarded up in their apartment buildings, all of this. So China's record was not good. And there are still questions about the origin of COVID-19. And I think from the beginning, the right convinced themselves that China did this deliberately. Right. And right. and China's lies meant that there's, there's just unknowable details and China covered up with, at times, the, the assistance of the World Health Organization, what actually happened. And, and they didn't share this information because it could be potentially embarrassing to them. Right. And that only helped fuel a lot of the right-wing conspiracies that still have an audience. And we're still seeing that play out today aren't yeah we? i mean as recently as monday the second of january monday night football game between cincinnati bengals and the buffalo bills safety for the buffalo bills demar hamlin makes a routine tackle and then collapses on the field stood up right after the play collapsed to the ground a few seconds later and it appears at some point in there his heart stopped the team's training staff performed cpr for eight minutes and they were able to resuscitate him in the moment. Thank God. We really wish Hamlin all the best. And we want to be clear, we don't know at this point. He's in the hospital. He's got tests running. I'm sure they'll tell us when they find out. We don't know what happened. However, people like Charlie Kirk came out almost immediately and blamed the vaccine. They had a hashtag. And they had a hashtag immediately after this happened. So... Why are they still doing this? Yeah, I saw I saw the hashtag died suddenly. Yeah, died which, suddenly. Which is a anti-vax book that of course finds any bit of anecdotal maybe quasi but essentially made up information to prove that the vaccines are the real problem. Right. It's interesting to really think about this and play it out because the right is so mad and so focused on China, they think, built this in a lab to destroy the world or take over the world or whatever it is. So they, they're convinced that this is China. They made it. They're doing it. But once it gets here, the real problem is always the vaccine. They don't they don't want to blame any of this on COVID. They don't want to talk about the side effects from COVID. It is always the vaccine mm -hmm. and that is that is built in to their narrative. They just they skip <laughs> even though they blame China for all of this happening. There always has to be another layer. There it can't just be China bad. It has to be China bad and China's in collusion with big pharma. And those are the the boogeymen or the big pharma and the the World Economic Forum and all of these things are all all these people are working together and and Hunter Biden Hunter <laughs> Hunter Biden's Hunter laptop Biden's is laptop. in there so with the with the bio labs in Ukraine that got tacked on later mm -hmm. they gotta they gotta add to it they gotta build on it they gotta give their audience more quote unquote evidence and so that's what we see here and Charlie Kirk has come out and pretended to be just very upset that he. Uh, what did he get called? Human scum? Human garbage. Or... Human, Human garbage. garbage. Yes. Yeah, he got lit up. Poor Charlie. He got lit up. Yeah. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, it can't, it can't be COVID. It can't be... It's easy to, to forget this today because a lot of people live a really long time and a lot of us had grandparents grow old and that were 
around and, and we got to grow up with them as, as part of our lives. But until very recently, it was extremely common for people to just die suddenly. Mm -hmm. And thank God for modern medicine. Thank God for vaccines. Thank God for (laughs) doctors and nurses who take care of us and keep us alive. But sometimes people still die. And thankfully, Damar Hamlin was able to receive expert care in the moment, and they resuscitated him. Mm -hmm. He is alive because of their training and the work that they did. But it can't just be a terrible thing that happened. No. It is always another layer. It's always more evidence. It's always, well, you've been lied to by the mainstream media and China and Big Pharma and all the people who are working against you. And aha, we found evidence. It is a freak thing. The the hit didn't didn't look particularly rough or out of the ordinary. His body didn't seem to move any particular way. This is not an unusual occurrence in the game of football. You'll see something roughly equivalent to what happened to him hundreds of times a game. For the most part, yeah. this is what tackling looks like. And it does happen. Freak accidents like this in the game of football. It's a rough game. It happens. Pads or not. This is yeah. a case of this could have happened to anybody that was playing it at any given time. Maybe he got hit in the wrong spot. Maybe he has a birth defect. It's it's not like... We all have an EKG Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe it's related to some other health concern that he wasn't aware of. We don't know. And like you said, we, we wish him the best and hope that he makes a full recovery, but my God, can it just be, can't we just go a few days? I know we can't. There are a bunch of ghouls. I know we we can't. We can't. It just won't. And Charlie Kirk was so, oh, oh, he's, he's so hurt. And how, how dare they, how dare they? (laughs) He added to his tweet, are you paying attention yet? Because, of course, it's, aha, they are, they're all after me. And all I did was, is ask a question. And I saw that on, well, he he goes on his show. And today, it's, I think, his first day back after, after the holidays. And who's his guest? Well, it is one of the biggest pushers of <sighs> anti-vaccine rhetoric in the known world, Robert Malone, who who is also thankfully, thankfully, thank you so much, Elon. He is back on Twitter. Yeah, uh, he is. He is. He is repersoned. He's repersoned. We were missing his um, important voice. Thank you, Elon. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and then they're they're promoting this this book when he's on there, and it's co-authored or the forward is written by RFK Jr. Oh God. It's like, yeah, the cause unknown, the epidemic of sudden deaths. And it's written by this guy named Edward Dowd, who I, I, I looked, I didn't recognize him and I had to look him up and everywhere he's quoted, they say he's ex BlackRock, which uh-huh. is, how is that, how is that related <laughs> To, I'm an expert on vaccines, says the former wealth management yeah. <laughs> officer at BlackRock. Uh, what, what is, what is this? It, you uh, thought quoting, you know, washed up B, C, D tier TV stars was bad. Now we've got financial managers coming in. You know, let's go get Scott Adams' opinion on it next. Yeah, Dilbert, the Dilbert creator, mm-hmm. he he knows it all. He's he's full full on with this world, but he talks a lot about vaccines and has a lot of similar things to say. <laughs> it is rather pervasive on the right and it it doesn't really matter what your credentials are. I am certain that if I felt the need I could look further into this Edward Dowd fellow and find out what in the hell happened to him that <laughs> that ended with him going down this road but I don't really want to and I I think we all Life know Life is too short. Yeah, it is. But I wanted to quote from this Vice News article that was about all of this anti-vax rhetoric that came out almost immediately and after Demar Hamlin collapsed and and that that story was making the rounds on social media and 
The title is Far Right Trolls Are Already Spreading Anti-Vax Conspiracies About Damar Hamlin. And it's by David Gilbert at Vice News. And he posted a little bit about who was doing this. And he did mention Charlie Kirk, the founder of TPUSA, who has 1.9 million followers. And Charlie, of course, didn't come out and say it. Right. And he but he said, this is tragic and all too familiar sight right now. Athletes dropping suddenly and everyone in his echo chamber knew knew exactly what he was saying. Then the article goes on to talk about Stu Peters, who is the guy who who made the conspiracy film died suddenly. And then the died suddenly hashtag was making the rounds. And of course, the died suddenly account is verified on Twitter. Of course. Thanks to. Thanks to Elon once again. And then the the Vice article talked about some of the similar rhetoric that ended up on Telegram, which is known for pushing conspiracies and the worst of the right-wing rhetoric. And yeah, it said on more fringe platforms like Telegram, users and conspiracy channels rushed to comment on the baseless connection between Hamlin's collapse and the vaccine. Some linked to fake Twitter accounts claiming to belong to the doctor who gave Hamlin his booster in December, while many linked to comments from cardiologist Peter McCullough, who is is right there with Robert Malone and being back on Twitter and pushing (laughs) this anti-vax rhetoric and good friend of RFK Jr. And Peter McCullough, who has touted ivermectin as a cure for COVID-19, despite multiple studies showing no evidence that it works. <laughs> and and there was a uh, few more people who were involved, but um, one commentator on a QAnon Telegram channel suggested that the doctors speaking about Hamlin's injury on TV were covering something up by failing to ask if he was vaxxed and claimed it was part of a wider conspiracy against men. Uh huh. Specifically, men. And part of the quote is the new world order is about feminization of men. So, <laughs> and I, I did go look on Telegram because I, because you hate I yourself. I hate myself. <laughs> 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 that was that was not planned. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I always, I always get I, Telegram I want... whenever I'm feeling that <laughs> bit of self-loathing, and maybe things are just going too well, and my outlook on life is a little too sunny. I think I'm going to go on Telegram and see if I can regulate that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, here's Milo's oh. channel. This ought to do it, man. It's been it's been a rough day. I'm going to make it worse. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Talking about him finding Jesus and his anti-vax rhetoric or whatever whatever the thing is is going on. But, yeah, I – so I I like the the listeners to be informed, and I think that's important, and also I'm sorry. But um, (laughs) looking at, in particular, the Gateway Pundit, our old friends over Hi. there, who happened, well, not surprisingly, decided that they needed to point this out, which I, I'm not, I have no idea if this is even true. And what's the point of, of fact checking? You can't fact check the Gateway Pundit. <laughs> I mean, no point. But they, it's the um, Gateway Pundit. Said, I mean, you can't. You yeah. Know, Exactly. The Antifa super soldiers are coming for us. Uh, the Gateway Pundit in 2017. We're still waiting for that to happen, but any minute now. Any minute. But in, anyway, on this post, they they highlighted Fed operatives move into place at Cincinnati Hospital where, where DeMar Hamlin is a patient. And then in all caps, no NFL player has died from on-field injury in over 50 years. Apparently those are related, but they have to throw the feds in there. Of course. The feds, because that that plays in all the other uh-huh. conspiracies about the FBI and the deep state and the cover up and and they're after Trump. And also the deep state's probably working with China to make sure that the, the big pharma is safe and the collusion isn't uncovered. And I, I, I don't. Somebody's going to go there. Somebody's going to make those connections. Because it's what they do, but there was there was one more from the Gateway Pundit. So the the Vice article mentioned that that users on Telegram were linking to this Twitter account that supposedly gave 
Damar Hamlin the vaccine, which is just obvious bullshit. And whenever there's this viral story, any sort of viral story that that appears suddenly and is kind of a it's a random event. It's it's not something that you could prepare no. for. It's just something Kyle Rittenhouse or it's Jesse Smollett or what what have you. All of these anonymous Twitter accounts will pop out on the right and the left and claim that they're related to whatever the viral moment is. And they'll, they'll blow up and some people know it's fake and some people think it's real and all this. So the quote unquote doctor shows up on Twitter said, Oh yeah, I gave him the vaccine and Charlie Kirk, of course. Well, the implication being Charlie Kirk is right. And all these other people who are just asking questions are being responsible. But this gateway pundit article, it just, the absurdity of it really stood out, but it said, this must be a bot account or a hoax. Would a doctor really disclose this info? Doctor alleges he administered Damar Hamlin's booster shot on December 26. Tweets out, quote, he passed all screenings, but he's a huge leftist and Trump hater. <laughs> <laughs> this this must be fake. This, uh, this is obviously not real. But I'm going to go ahead and share this story about the supposed doctor who gave him the vaccine days ago and... Like it's 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 so perfect and so fake that even the Gateway pundit, like, ah, it's got to be a bot account. But we should just go ahead and tell you because that's what we're just we're just reporting. They're just doing their jobs, yeah, right? Of course. I think I'm going to try and see if I can get a <laughs> Chat GPT to write Gateway pundit articles and see what happens. I'll bet it does a great <laughs> job. I bet they probably fired their writing staff a long time ago, and this is how they've been doing it. They just didn't tell us. Yeah, and I mean there were there were several more obscure accounts and and information that got pushed on telegram and i'm sure if you go deep enough down the rabbit hole it just the conspiracy grows as it as it always does but yeah you're right they 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 just can't help themselves they don't want to be honest brokers it's the narrative above all else Mm -hmm. and that's what we saw once again. And I think that probably leads us to our, our final narrative that, of of course, they had to go with. Of right? course, because the one thing that they just can't seem to get their heads around is that they're the ones that did January 6th. But it doesn't seem to stick because, once again... Right-wing media has found the real person responsible for January 6th, not Donald Trump, not any of his advisors, none of the people on MAGA media who spent months pushing stolen election lies, not Roger Stone, not Jack Posobiec, not his embrace of conspiracy theories like QAnon or groups like TPUSA who bust people to the Capitol to attend the January 6th speeches where they were urged to fight like hell at a Save America rally. No, it's a guy named Ray Epps. He's the one. Who is he? What is the point of all of this? <laughs> he is some guy. He definitely was in D.C. on January 6th. He was there on January 5th. Unfortunately for him, though I, I have a hard time feeling a whole lot of sympathy, he apparently was accosted by somebody in the street who convinced him it was a good idea to say that they needed to go into the Capitol and so this video, it reemerged later on because Epps is seen on video. He went past the barricades, but he did not go into the Capitol building. But he whispered in someone's ear who did go in the Capitol building. And there's this video of him the day before saying that they should go into the Capitol because somebody told him to say it. It was some stupid media stunt and he bought into it. And it's unfortunate for him that he did, but he's just some guy and he didn't, he didn't get prosecuted. And so Darren Beatty of revolver news decided that, Oh, we found the guy. Mm -hmm. The Antifa story just really was not sticking. They tried it from day one. It was, you look at, there were quite a bit of deleted tweets from people who 
wanted to say it was the left or kind of even even people like uh, Richard Grinnell, Trump's DNI, tweeted on, on January 6th or right after that everyone who was involved in this should be prosecuted and we need to we need to go after them, which is absurd because how did he not know that that these were Trump supporters? But they really they had their they had their talking points, mm-hmm. they had their line. Absolutely. And they went there and it didn't stick. And so here's this guy who we have this very, very flimsy evidence that oh, he if you if you twist it, if you pull enough strings, they figured they could make him look like an FBI informant. And so this this Ray Epps fellow, the qu- supposed FBI informant, uh, planned the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's absurd. And he's literally just some guy. He is a guy who bought he's into some this guy. rhetoric, doesn't entirely not buy into it at this point. He claims that his life has been ruined, and I don't have too hard of a time buying that. But he still believes that the election was stolen and that he was doing the right thing by going to the Capitol to protest this. This is a guy who was a member of Oath Keepers really early on. He said in his testimony to the January 6th committee, he said that he left Oath Keepers in 2011 because he was convinced at that point that Stuart Rhodes was crazy. And Stuart Rhodes was apparently talking about going up to Portland, Oregon, and trying to get some of these Antifa to blow up things the way he wanted them to be blown up, rather than the way that he claimed that they were blowing things up up there. And this guy bailed out on Stuart Rhodes at that point, but I guess they maintained contact enough to the point where he would go to a rally that Stuart Rhodes was promoting. So we know that I don't think Ray Epps, honestly, is too bright. I think that he's just one of these people who suck down a lot of this kind of media in the time leading up to the election and decided that he had to go off and do something about it. And he was really in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, he absolutely was. And it does seem like he really kind of, kind of took the the funnel of, of BS and stolen election lies and all of that, that, media sphere really went straight down the gullet and he he believed it he bought it it's why he showed up but he's just like you said he's just some guy and yeah if we look at how far this has spread it started with Darren Beatty and looking at the the article he put out about apps in October 2021 and it starts with a tweet by Thomas Massey and he said I question Attorney General Garland about whether there were federal agents present on 1-6 and whether they agitated to go into the Capitol. Attorney General Garland refused to answer, which, of course, he's going to refuse because it's... It's an ongoing investigation. That's what they do. That's what they do. That's absolutely what they do. And it would be kind of crazy if there weren't FBI informants involved to some degree... But the right loves to attack the FBI for doing their job in any sort of way. And just because you had informants, just because there were some snitches, it doesn't mean their information is all good or reliable or that they can do much beyond tell tell their handler what they've heard and what they think they know. And then the FBI has to gather that information and decide what's credible and what's not and how to act on it. But the idea that a even well-placed informant can control the actions of the other people in his group or <laughs> that he he's somehow the mastermind behind all of this is really absurd when you think about it. You think of the hundreds, thousands of people who were in D.C. on January 6th and supported Trump. It's pretty illogical, but their audience buys into it for a lot of reasons we've already talked about. The FBI is somehow this omnipotent presence that can make anybody do anything and a bunch of incompetents who can't ever get anything right at the same time. 
And this changes yeah. from day to day, from minute to minute, depending on what they need for their particular narrative. But there are many good people at the many. FBI. Don't 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 think we're hmm, many. many. We're not we're not attacking all of those good people at the FBI. It's just the other ones. It's just the and the the other ones will change and and we'll find new ones we don't like and we will scapegoat them and run them out and harass them and oh they they can't live at their house anymore because they're getting death threats well that doesn't have anything to do with us nope. we so did nothing wrong why would you even ask us how, how, they did nothing wrong but yeah so the, the he goes on with the article and calls him the mystery man ray apps and he builds this conspiracy i don't even want to do all the all the dot connecting that he did here but of course he has all these pictures of him and darren Beatty is is very good at taking a lot of data that is really seemingly and sometimes obviously not connected or relevant or missing key details and he is able to build a somewhat coherent narrative that is good enough and and when people want to cite their source well here it is. And so he built this narrative and it grew on the right and it got pushed really hard by the Bannon sphere. And it is now taken as gospel by some of these people. Right. And it's what they do. And and he's Beatty's had several more articles. He expand he's expanded on this. He's added to it. And you end up with guys like Senator Ted Cruz bringing it up in a hearing and talking. Well, he, he asked directly who is Ray Epps and to, it, yeah. Was Ray Epps the fed? This is and, just so typical of what they do. I mean, you've got David DePape who buys their propaganda, goes and attacks Paul Pelosi and they make him out to be a male prostitute. Then you've got Ray Epps, who goes and buys their propaganda and helps do J six. And then they play him up like he's a fed. It, it's like, yeah. even if you go along with all of this stuff, they're not going to treat you. You're not going to be welcomed as a hero. And they are, they are happy to burn mm -hmm. you at the first opportunity they get. They will. They just don't care. Moscow does not believe in tears and neither does the Magosphere. <laughs> Yeah, they are happy to have you in the replies and at the Capitol and as part of the the gang. But when they need to discard you, they uh -huh. will. And wheels on the bus. They're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it's something that they're gonna keep doing. They need to downplay January six, and they will continue to attempt to do so. And from any objective observer, from any person who isn't just a just a diehard fan of that movement, it it's pretty obviously absurd and wrong and deflection, mm -hmm. but it works well enough with their people and for their movement. I, I know we both watched the tweets happen in mm -hmm. real time when January 6th was happening. And the right wing cope and fear and anger, honestly, for me, it was unmatched, unparalleled. Never seen, before never that. seen anything like this. Like they, they really thought their movement was over, that it was irreversible, and they seemed human for once. Not, not a good kind of human, not a, not a decent kind of person, but really weak and vulnerable and scared. Well, they knew how badly they had screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. They knew this was huge. People died. They stormed the Capitol. They did a lot of property damage, cost millions of dollars in damage, caused Congress people to shelter in place. Anybody who wasn't just completely on that, on that violence, absolutely knew what they had done that day. And I think that's part of the reason why you're still seeing, you know, people who might have some culpability about some of this, people like Jack Posobiec. Uh, he's mentioned Ray Epps at least a hundred times on the timeline. One thing and another, quote a really wonderful one that I found today 
he says, this is to former Congressman Adam Kinzinger, January 13, 22. Hi, Adam Kinzinger, me again. Please explain why Stuart Rhodes was charged without entering the Capitol when you say Ray Epps committed no crime because he didn't enter the Capitol. It's like, never mind that we remember you immediately afterwards trying to throw a guy named John Sullivan under the bus for being the provocateur who supposedly did all of this. You're you're sitting here blaming Ray Epps for all of this, and you're sticking up for a guy who just got himself convicted of seditious conspiracy as a result of his experiences, probably because Ray Epps didn't have a load of guns across the river from DC that day. I mean, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and speculate that maybe Ray Epps hasn't spent the last decade organizing this kind of stuff against the United States. And it wasn't just Stuart Rhodes. It wasn't, there wasn't just one person. I think even even the people that did this, even the people that were involved, the absurdity of putting this all on one guy is it just doesn't make any sense. And no, it doesn't. And I went looking on his timeline, maybe for the name GNA or Baked Alaska or any other version of that, you know, the guy that was in Pelosi's office on her desk phone making calls. We know that he and Jack have some friends in common, but of course there's nothing about him. No. And, and Jack was photographed with him several times in 2016 and maybe at least in the early 2017. Mm -hmm. They were, they were buddies. Mm -hmm. They were, they were friends. They were, uh, palling around together. And yeah, for, for a little bit, Baked Alaska was part of the MAGA 3X with Posobiec and Cernovich and, that kind of went belly up in part because Baked Alaska went down his hard right, full on neo Nazi path, and and Jack and and Cerno wanted to be respectable right wing provocateurs, crypto right wing provocateurs, as it were. <laughs> Baked forgot about the crypto. Yeah, he sort of just went all the by way. the dip and all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Jack was outside the Capitol on January sixth. He took pictures. He saw it happening and. Man, he seemed pretty shook by all mm -hmm. that. And doesn't look like he's going to have any consequences, as most of the, the big-time figures are, are are not dealing with. But, yeah, it, it did. It left a, a pretty sizable wound. And they they felt it that day, and they still know that, there's a certain legacy to January 6th that is never going to go away. And it's a, it's a stench that will follow them around. Mm -hmm. And so they're always going to try to poke a little hole here and find an excuse there. But this was a result of their movement of MAGA media created the monster that then stormed the Capitol. And most of the people who, did the the preaching the sermons uh, really they weren't the ones who entered the building by no. and large but they know what they said uh -huh. and they know what it led to who will rid me of this troublesome priest <laughs> seriously <laughs> that's what this is yeah they want somebody to yeah. go along and do this kind of work so they can step back and say well that's a that guy was a nutcase that guy was a male prostitute. That guy was a fed. That guy was this. But in reality, there are people here that are pulling the levers and they have names. And you can go back and look at the news over the last five years, six years. You can look at where these people show up and you see the same cast of characters. You see the same cast of names. The people who actually do the hard stuff get arrested, get run out, get their lives ruined. And somehow the people that keep pushing it keep going. Yeah, they attack things like the Election Integrity Project, which essentially cataloged the lies prior to January 6th and the people that were most responsible for pushing these lies and, and making these stories go viral and and gain this audience. And so, yeah... That group, and in cooperation with DHS, 
they were a target. Mm-hmm. They went after them. And then we had DHS leaks, and and it's all that attack becomes a continuation of the same narrative, the same effort against the deep state. So it's all a continuing pattern of finding someone to blame and then attacking the people that know who's really to blame and catalog and keep records of who's to blame. And it's like the same reason these guys go after Wikipedia Mm -hmm. because it is a permanent ledger of their bullshit of their conspiracies and lies and the people that they've hurt along the way. And there's really not a lot we can do, but I think in 2017, what you and I have been committed to is archiving everything. Yeah. And we aren't going to by any means claim we were the first ones to do that. But we followed these people for mm-hmm. years and we archived a lot of their shit. And a, a lot more people are doing it now and are on it. And as a result, I think the right wing tactics have changed because For a while there, they could just lie and lie and lie and delete it, and people would just shrug their shoulders and move on. They'd have to go with it. They would just, they would delete the tweets, they would delete the posts and social media, and they would gaslight you right to your face. Yep. So I think the strategy stays the same, and it has been consistent from the beginning, but the tactics do evolve. Right. So going after Ray Epps, going after the deep state and the election integrity project, these sort of things are all part of the same strategy, but the tactics will continue to evolve as the landscape changes Mm -hmm. and we will keep an eye on it and let you know how it progresses. We certainly will. Thanks for listening to the did nothing wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can go to did nothing wrong pod.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at James, the word four, and the letter M, all one word, and Grizza, BJJ, G R Z A, BJJ, as well as DNW Pod. Thanks again for tuning in, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.